thank you to everyone for coming, um, for giving us part of your evening. So the general purpose of this event is really to talk about sex and safer sex during COVID-19. How do we even do that safely? Um, because no one seems to really be talking about it. Um, <laughs> I am Julia. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior student wellness advocate in our Office of Health Promotion. Um, and I'll hand it off to Hana to continue with other introductions. Hello, I'm Hana. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a student worker at SMPR, and I'm also a senior. Um, so if attendees have any questions that they want to ask the panelists, um, please ask them in the Q&A section, and then we'll get to them um, in a bit. So I'm going to be introducing the panelists. So um, we are very grateful for our panelists for being here today. Um, our first panelist is Betsy Lane Gettas who is a family and women's health nurse practitioner at Shack, And then um, our second panelist is Daniela Cohen, who's a Carleton Community Covenant community member, as well as a chemistry professor and chair of the chemistry department. And last but not least, Matt Kluster, um, who is a co-lead of the contact tracing at Carleton, as well as the director of the Summer Liberal Arts Institute. Um, so would each panelist mind telling us a little bit about themselves and their work related to COVID-19? And Betsy, would you mind starting? I'd be happy to. Thank you for pulling this together um, and for forwarding on the uh, Boston University uh, panel. That was very helpful. So as you said, I'm a nurse practitioner at SHAC. Um, and uh, so COVID has totally flipped our world um, on our work world and our the use of our space. Um, my particular little um, role uh, at SHAC relation to, in relation to COVID is um, done remotely. Um, so I've been in this chair for about a year now. Um, or 10 months now. Um, and I, the, the student facing part of my role is um, monitoring or, or reaching out to students in this term, it'll just be students in isolation. Um, so students who are, are sick or have positive test results. Um, and by definition are isolated. So um, part of our role is to check in with them, see how they're doing. And I'm one of the main ones that does that. Matt, would you mind going next? Sure, happy to. Thanks again for um, uh, inviting me to participate. So um, the capacity that I've worked in, in in the context of COVID is one of working with Janet Lewis Muth as a co-lead to help develop the contact tracing case investigating system on Carleton's campus. Um, and so last semester in particular, she and I worked with a team of uh, Carleton staff to engage in that work, um, making sure that students who either test positive or are symptomatic find their way to an appropriate space. Um, folks who are in contact with those who test positive find their way to a safe and appropriate space as well so that their needs can be cared for. Um, and so that was the primary work that we did working with a lot of wonderful folks across campus, including Betsy and Shaq, as well as the Shaq staff and um, Carrie from Student Life, uh, who uh, addresses the needs of folks while they're in quarantine and isolation, as well as many, many others. So I am, I was part of the group that uh, wrote the covenant and talked a little bit and tried to set the tone as to how the college was gonna going to like try to do the best that we could out of these new conditions. I am the chair, there is a committee that it's an advisory committee to Dink Livingstone. It's called Advisory Committee of Student Life. And I'm the chair of that committee. Uh, and in that committee, we, um, we just try to be alert and we talk a lot about COVID and what the protocols are. And the committee has faculty, staff, and um, students. So it's a good place for all of us to interchange opinions and see how things are going and bring things to the attention of Dean Livingston. Um, but otherwise I'm just a normal prof trying to figure out how we deal with all of this. Yeah, thank you. Um, so. 
just to start with some questions. So this first one will go to Matt and that is basically what is COVID just a reminder and how does it spread? Sure. So uh, COVID-19 is a virus. Um, COVID is actually a word that's assembled from three different words. So CO stands for Corona, which is the type of virus it is. The VI of COVID is for virus. And then the D is for disease. So COVID is this kind of mashup of those three words. Um, 19 pertains to the fact that it was discovered in, in Wuhan, China in 2019. Um, and it's one of many types of viruses called coronaviruses. They're called coronavirus because when you look at them under a microscope, they kind of look like a crown. Um, but um, coronaviruses are not um, uh, foreign to humans' bodies, but this one, this particular one is. Um, so there's many types of coronaviruses. This one is novel to a human system, but is thought to have been active in um, at least another animal system, one other animal system for some time prior to infecting humans. So um, one of the challenges with COVID-19 is that each of these coronaviruses behaves a little differently in the human body. And in this particular case, um, this is an understudied virus because it's new to the human system. And so we're still trying to learn a lot about it. And there's a second part to your question. I'm sorry. And that was just briefly, how does it spread? Okay, so yeah, spread is, is primarily through particulates. So this could be somebody breathing and, and respiring and particulates from, their, from um, the process of respiring going into the air, could be from a sneeze or a cough, um, you know, primarily through mucus or saliva. Uh, that can either remain in the air through these microscopic particulates or can end up on surfaces that people can then put uh, their hands on or get in contact with and then transfer the virus into their body. And in, in particular, the, in the context of this um, panel, you know, when we're talking about intimate partnerships, of course, exchanging saliva would be the, the primary concern when it comes to intimacy. That's a great, um, you really set me up for the next question. Um, so Betsy, can COVID-19 be sexually transmitted? Oh, I think you're, you're on mute. Sorry about that. No um, thanks Matt for, for setting that up. Um, so it's sexually transmitted if your sexual um, and intimate behavior is face to face in the same room with another person um, because it is primarily transmitted through this um, droplets and, and then aerosolization of those droplets. Um, the virus has been found in semen, in feces, um, not yet um, in vaginal fluids, um, but it's unclear whether it is um, infection producing in those other fluids. Um, but it would be safest to assume that it is. And then of course, certainly it is in, in saliva. So sexually transmitted is not a specific question, right? Because you could have virtual sex, you could have phone sex, you could have all kinds of sexual and intimate um, contact with another person that doesn't involve um, risk of, of uh, saliva or, or, or um, aerosols droplet transmission. So while we're still on the topic of um, sexually transmitted viruses, um, is SHAC still open for STI testing and screening? Um, yes, SHAC is still open. As I said, uh, um, our primary focus has had to switch to COVID, but we are trying to maintain as much of our other services as possible. And sexual health is one of the biggest, um, uh, other than COVID, probably right after COVID is sexual health in terms of um, what we're asked to, to help students with. Um, all visits at SHAC now start with a telehealth portion. So um, uh, usually with a sexual health visit, then there has to be an in-person visit for the, um, an exam or collection of specimens, but we, we wanna keep that in-person visit as, as short as possible. Um, so yes, we, we are open. I will say that the CDC um, 
has changed the guidelines for SDI testing um, in the in the era of COVID. Um, and there's a few other factors. So one factor is to reduce face-to-face um, uh, -face time between a clinician and and a person seeking care. Um, so they, they've changed the guidelines such that um, there might be instances where it would be fine to treat rather than test. Um, just go ahead and treat and under certain conditions or, or give the partner, give a person medication for their partner rather than insisting that the partner come in and also get tested. There's also supply chain issues. Guess what is the same for um, COVID testing and STI testing? Those dang swabs. Um, and little tubes. So um, there's been a sub issue getting some of the supplies. Um, Northfield Hospital has changed what they've used for quite a while. And then there's also uh, a shortage of one of the main medications used to treat, um, uh, well, mostly used to treat chlamydia. So, so there's been a shift. So if you've saw STI testing in the past, it might look a little bit different um, this time. Uh, dur during this period when there's these shortages and trying to reduce risk of spread. But yes, call shack, um, you, uh, unlike prior to COVID, you can't make uh, appointments, students can't make appointments themselves, can't self-schedule, um, but reach out to shack, reach out to uh, either through secure message or by calling. Um, we are still there um, wanting to help students meet their, their needs related to sexual health. Um, our next question is for Daniela. Um, can you describe the purpose of the covenant? Who was involved and who was involved in its creation? So the idea was that as a campus, as a community, we needed a common understanding of how we were going to deal with trying to do well in COVID. Um, so the purpose was to set up the ground rules that will allow for um, the community to keep growing. We didn't, we were trying not to create something that was so prescriptive that then it wasn't worthy to be on campus. Everyone, it's pretty hard to be on campus, but the idea was to make it worthy. So we were trying to uh, walk that line between being as safe as we could while having an experience that was worth the risk. Because there's a risk for everyone to be on campus. So that was the line that we're trying to walk and it was done with the understanding that we have a pretty strong community where people on campus believe on helping each other. We believe that everyone is trying to do their best and that what we mostly needed was clear rules and clear guidelines. So we will not need to be thinking all the time about what was right and what was wrong. We could load, lower the cognitive load or trying to figure out how to behave while um, understanding that we were all likely to make mistakes and trying to give guidelines about how to um, deal with that kind of situation. Um, the group that wrote it had staff and staff from different offices, had faculty, had students, was actually we were quite pleased because it was a quite hard conversation uh, in the sense that the product that we were trying to produce, we all believe could have an important impact, uh, but everyone was really involved. People disagree. We th said what we thought. and It was really a really nice um, activity just to write it. Um, and so that's how it came out. I hope I have answered your question. Yeah, so while we're also talking about the covenant then, um, could you provide just a brief overview of how it relates to intimacy and sexual relationships? Yeah, so as we were writing the covenant, it was very clear to us that we, would, we wanted to have, have an opportunity for people to have as normal as possible a life at Carleton. And none of us could imagine that life without having intimate contact and having relationships that were worth having and that were like human and that you know had to do with the times that we're all living so we were we were thinking quite a bit about it and many times we stopped by and said okay how how can we delineate so we can offer an opportunity while not violating 
other people's privacy or not privacy, it's just safety. So yeah, we talk quite a bit. We were quite explicit about it. And then a little bit more specifically about how um, the covenant pertains to relationships. Does seeing a partner who is not part of your bubble violate the covenant? And does seeing a partner who is not a non-Carlton community member violate the covenant? So that's very different because uh, the bubble is, I don't know, you might have noticed, we didn't talk about the bubble in the covenant because that's a very hard to define. We we didn't feel it was worthy to even mention it because it wasn't a word that we could understand unless we could put a number on what the bubble meant and we were not ready to do that either. Um, so having said that, understanding the bubble as the part of the common covenant that talks about minimizing close contact, uh, seeing a partner, um, I'm not seeing having an intimate relationship that involves you know, having sex with someone that involves interchanging fluids, um, it's okay. It's in as much as you are thoughtful that that will not be increasing your the number of your cost contacts a lot or much, and also that your the place where you're doing it, uh, you're not violating someone else's needs. So we had this long conversation. I hope it's reflected in the covenant about how you need to talk with your roommates and the people that you're sharing spaces. Because you can decide that, okay, I'm gonna be more careful in how, in I'm gonna be more careful in the sport that I'm playing and I'm not gonna go to practice and I'm gonna have a partner, whatever, you can negotiate that any way you want, but you need to make sure that you're not imposing in your roommate who is also gonna have a close contact if you are having sex with someone else. Um, so, so that's on campus. Then off campus is quite different. So we have this, we decided as a community that we were not going to invite people from off campus to buildings. So it's tricky now because in the summer, I don't know, there's a line says that talks about being off outside. So in the summer, when it's nice outside, it's not there is no big problem. The problem is when you're in buildings. So inviting anyone from off campus to a building, it's not, it's actually forbidden. We were also careful in the covenant, differentiated things that were really forbidden from things that were recommended. Um, we wanted to, everything that we said, it's, it's a no-no should really be a no-no. We didn't wanna have room for that. Um, so going inside, inviting anyone from outside the community in a building, totally wrong. I mean, not allowed. The seeing someone outside, going basically going to St. Olaf or going to someone else's camp house that it's not within the community, um, it doesn't so much violate the covenant itself because in the covenant it says to minimize contacts, to minimize trip outside. But later on, there was a communication like I think it was around week six. That also resulted in a change on the FAQ about what is okay to do outside. So it's okay to go to work, it's okay to go to groceries, and it's okay to go to the doctor. That doesn't include it is okay to have intimate relationships with someone. And if you're going outside town, it's even worse because you need to get tested and there's a whole different protocol. But I was just imagining your question when I was reading it as, going to St. Olaf, for example, or just, and that's the part that it's not okay either. Yeah, that's a good point to make. Um, so now we're gonna pivot very slightly to, um, to Matt, and that is, would you just briefly provide a general overview of how the contact tracing process works? Um, and then more specifically also, you know, if a student tests positive for COVID-19, how does contact tracing work then for their sexual partners? Sure, and I'm, I'm gonna apologize if I get a little long-winded, so get out the shepherd so it can pull me off the screen if I, if I get rattling on too long. But one of the challenges here is that it, is, it gets kind of terms heavy in terms of, of um, what's involved in contact tracing and different categories of 
um, ways we need to address the potential for um, spread of virus on campus. And so kind of two of the primary terms you'll hear thrown around a lot are isolation and quarantine. And I just feel I need to kind of de define those right out of the gate. So isolation on campus is really used in two capacities. One capacity is if somebody is symptomatic, um, has symptoms as defined um, on a diagnostic chart and as, I, as um, diagnosed by SHAC, um, as uh, somebody who is experiencing symptoms that are analogous with what somebody who has COVID might be experiencing. And so somebody may go into isolation owing to symptoms only to test later to verify whether those symptoms ultimately culminate in a positive test or not. And then you also have isolation owing to a positive test, and that's if somebody has taken a test and the result has, has uh, returned with a positive, um, indicating that they do have viral RNA in their system. Um, the term quarantine is applied strictly to those who are close contacts of somebody who um, has tested positive for COVID. So we don't use the word quarantine technically in any other capacity. Quarantine and isolation are tossed around pretty loosely, but quarantine is used in the capacity of somebody who's a close contact of somebody who's tested positive. Now, what do we mean by close contact? Um, the rules um, as defined by CDC and Minnesota Department of Health is that we really need to stay six feet or greater apart from one, one another. If we break that um, imaginary barrier of six feet and we stay within six feet of one another for greater than 15 minutes, um, that makes somebody uh, potentially a close contact. Um, somebody's defined really as a close contact if they are within that six feet of one another for 15 minutes or longer during the time when one of the individuals in the, in the contact is infectious. And infectiousness can really be defined by, um, you know, a time when somebody is symptomatic, uh, leading to 48 hours prior to when they develop those symptoms, um, or if somebody has had a positive test result or 48 hours prior to that positive test result. Uh, so somebody could be feeling great and fine two days later, test, um, get a positive result, and all of a sudden you may find yourself a contact of that individual and have to go into quarantine, um, even though that individual had no clue that they were COVID positive and, and had no symptoms indicating that that would be the case. So for, let me just pause there. Is that clear? Have I articulated those things relatively clearly? Okay, so how the process works then, um, I'll summarize uh, hopefully quickly here, is Basically, if somebody is identified as being COVID positive, so let's say somebody gets back a positive COVID test, what the uh, case investigating contact tracing team on campus will do, the CICT team, um, is they will um, have one of the staff members who's trained by the Minnesota Department of Health to engage in a formal interview with the person who tested positive, that individual will call the positive case, as we call them, and will engage in an interview. And this is a formal interview. The people on that team do report uh, formally to the Minnesota Department of Health. These numbers do go into Minnesota's formal numbers of positive COVID cases. And that individual will engage in, in a uh, interview that lasts about 45 minutes to an hour. And that interview really has two primary goals. The first goal is to try to figure out where the person who tested positive might have contracted the virus from. And the second goal is to figure out who they may have given the virus to. Okay? And so that goes back to this notion of contacts. Um, at that point in time, the individual who is being interviewed will be asked to share who they've been in close contact with, again, that's within that six feet for 15 minutes or more, leading to 48 hours prior to that positive test or symptom onset. And at that point in time, it's absolutely critical that the person being interviewed um, share all of the names of the people that meet those criteria. 
Um, it's absolutely critical. That is the most important part of this process because if names are left off that list, either purposefully or accidentally, that's how unchecked virus can spread across campus. People can have contracted the virus, not have been identified, and then go on to spread it to other people. So, um, so once the um, uh, case investigator is finished with that interview, the person who is COVID positive will be asked to move to an isolation space. In that space, all their needs will be cared for, their, their meals will be tailored to their dietary needs and Shaq will be checking in on them daily to evaluate their health. Um, at that point in time, also all of their formal contacts will be contacted and asked to move to a quarantine space. And um, when the calls are made to the contacts, this isn't the sort of call, and this is where it gets tricky, where we're, it's up for debate uh, as to whether they're going to be a contact and whether they're going to go to a quarantine space or not. Um, it's more of um, uh, informing people that they've been identified and they need to comply. Uh, and so folks are then moved to quarantine. And then the last piece I'll share, and I can elaborate further if needed, is isolation uh, as a process is typically a 10 day long process. And there are really criteria that you have to meet in order to make it out of isolation. So you have to serve the 10 days, you have to be fever free for 24 hours or longer without fever reducing medication. And then you also have to have, if you've been symptomatic, the symptoms have to begin to dissipate. Um, in the case of quarantine, it's typically a 14 day process, which is kind of the pain of the, of the whole circumstance. You have to quarantine longer than somebody has to isolate, but that's because it can take between two and 14 days for the virus to actually manifest itself in a person's system. So those are the durations and that's um, a quick primer on the process. Thank you, that was very thorough. Um, so my next question is for Betsy. Um, so if we, and we're pivoting a little bit, um, if we do decide to engage in sexual activity in person, what are some things to consider to reduce COVID-19 transmission? I'm just thinking of like, if you decide to, to engage, like you've gone through several steps already of of determining what you're comfortable with um and uh I, I mean this is such good practice for any kind of relationship like what are you comfortable with what what are what's okay what's not okay in terms of of intimate um communication intimate activity with another person and then this layer of covid is is just another layer on top of that what kind of risk are you comfortable taking and so I would say the sexual activity starts with the self, right? Starts with identifying what am I comfortable with and what am I not comfortable with and, and communicating that to the other person. Um, and, you know, having that genuine conversation because um, that person may have very different um, understanding of transmission of the typical to STIs and then may have different understanding of the, uh, the, transmission of, of um, the coronavirus. Um, so you want you want to know yourself, right? And you want to communicate that to your partner and your potential partner, and you want to hear the same from that person. Um, so if you get to the step of, of um, okay, we're, we're comfortable with the same level of risk, um, then, well, then just think through it. it so Hanna, was the question that you've decided to have face-to-face -face or, or that you've just decided to explore sexuality together? I think it was that you decided face-to-face. -face. Okay, because there's a whole lot that you could do um, um, before you, did, uh, other than face-to-face, -face, right? That's a, that's a slice, that's a slice of it. It tends to be the slice that we go to first and that where I sit in working with, you know, in do, working with STI testing for years and years and years, that's where I'm most comfortable. But it was helpful in doing some of the reading for this to just to just remember, like, there's a whole lot of ways to be flirt, flirtatious and sexy and intimate and um, that don't involve being face to face. Okay, but your question was face to face. Wear a mask, 
I see the question in the chat, but um, that will reduce risk to some extent. Um, and you'd, but you'd want to talk to the to the partner, right? Or what's your um, what's your comfort with that? But if if the activity can still be performed with a mask on, wearing a mask um, would help reduce the risk to some extent. Um, and think about where what direction you're going to be facing. <laughs> I mean, those droplets tend to go that way. Um, so you might think about what activities you're doing and will you actually be face to face or will you both be, would you be facing opposite directions or both be facing the same direction? Um, if you can, it doesn't, you know, if, if you can plan it with that level of detail, you might be able to reduce your risk to some extent. Um, but I really wanna, I, I was so impressed with the guy on the, on the Boston University vi video um, and I, but I'll wait till I'm asked about that. <laughs> yeah, so then the next question is, um, if you choose maybe not to have sex in person, well then what are the safest ways to even have a sexual experience right now? So um, obviously the, the safest way to have a sexual experience right now is to do it remotely or to do it with yourself. Um, masturbation, mutual masturbation across a video platform, um, um, sexting um, gets all termed under cyber, cyber sex. Um, and, um, and, but then this guy, well, this, this guy, I'll attribute it to him, but he just said, focus on intimacy. Fo uh, focus on intimacy and focus on fun. What, what do you wanna do and, and how can you do it um, with the greatest safety and with the greatest kind of integrity and honesty about, about what you're comfortable with. Um, so, so like I said, masturbation, um, mutual masturbation, um, shared across a video platform um, uh, or shared, uh, then this guy said, what about the phone? Do you remember when people talked on the phone? Um, the human voice can be incredibly sexy and incredibly flirtatious. So you could go back to that. And then there's a certain mystery, right? Cause you're just talking. And then maybe the next level would be, um, you know, more visual, like get creative, use this obstacle, quote unquote, obstacle of distance or remoteness as an opportunity to, to get creative. Um, people have been getting creative about how to be intimate and have fun with each other for, for, you know, eons. So this is, you, you could just say this is okay. Now we have to figure it out around um, reducing the risk of transmitting this virus, right? They figured it out in terms of how to re reduce the risk of transmitting HIV a generation ago. Well, this is, is a sort of a similar process. Um, I will say, let's see. I, I will say if you're gonna use it at any, any kind of media, um, to, and this is a little bit beyond my scope of, of, of knowledge, but I thought it was very important. You all may know about this, more about this already than I do, um, to be very uh, careful about protecting your privacy. Like don't share any videos that have, um, where you'd be recognizable, right? Your face or, or recognizable tattoos or, or body marks of any kind. To be very careful that that wouldn't end up on some site that you didn't want it to be on. Um, Let's see, there was a, a reference made to app enabled sex toys. I think these came out before COVID, but um, they'd have a, a, certainly a new market now. Um, like just think, you might be able to make a sex toy that your partner in another room or in another building has, you might be able to make say that sex toy vibrate um, from where you are and sort of tease your partner that way or flirt with your partner that way. Um, I personally don't have any experience with these, nor have I talked to many people who do. If anyone on this call um, has experience with any of these apps, that would be kind of the next level of, of exploration for that. So I would just encourage creativity and humor and um, safety. Thanks, Betsy. And um, 
in terms of online safety, SMPR has a lot of stuff on our social media about um, online safety um, and intimacy and sex. So great. Out on Instagram, if you'd want a little bit more information about that. Um, so our next question is to everyone. Um, and it's about how should we go about having conversations with our partners about COVID-19 safety? I would just say, bring it up, bring up the topic. Um, say, hey, you know, what What have you thought about? What have, what's been your experience? When was the last time you were tested? I mean, these are kind of the same questions you might have uh, in relation to other STIs. Um, and then know, but even before you have that conversation with your partner, know what it is for yourself. And then it's, a, and then tr trust yourself. Um, you don't need to be, you know, not to, to not be open to manipulation or to not be open to being shamed about what your, um, where your lines are. And of course, not shaming someone else. They have come up with their approach um, on their own and they can, they can live with that. It may mean that you don't wanna get that close to them um, if there's that much of a difference. I'm really curious what others would say. I will add just, be curious about where the other person is coming from. It's very likely that the other person had thought about this too. Uh, and just try to make this conversation part of the growing to get to know each other too. So don't, to the extent, um, this is a, it's a pretty charged topic. So it's easy for us not to be open-minded and to not always expect the best from everyone, but just remind yourself uh, that you're just trying to get to know the other person um, in many ways and being able to have this conversation, it's an important way of just making sure you try to give that person a chance to explain themselves. Yeah, I'll just talk, I don't wanna be the intimacy buzzkill here, but I <laughs> one of the reasons I went into so much detail about the contact tracing case investigating is, um, in addition to the, the, we're living at a time where in addition to the typical risks associated with intimacy, now we have this added new one of the potential for quarantine um, and potentially isolation should you ultimately be a close contact of somebody to test positive or get COVID yourself uh, as a result of one of these encounters. So um, I would hate to think that that would be a significant driving force in, in these sorts of intimate personal interactions, but it's a factor. And I think as, as folks are contemplating intimacy, I think somebody has to really, in, in the classic senses of intimacy, somebody has to kind of really just be willing to take the risk um, of understanding that if they do engage in sexual intercourse in the face-to-face -face contact context and one of those folks that engages in it tests positive you are a contact right uh, the person who didn't test positive is going to be a contact and that comes with all of the um, unfortunate consequences there and so just something to weigh not something that to, to allow to drive all aspects of life but something to consider and, but with that in mind perhaps part of the conversation should be make sure that you're thinking of a plan that, okay, we're both willing to do this. And this is the plan that I thought, well, what is your plan? So make the planning, if you decide to engage, part of the conversation as well. Because that's also gonna help you to realize, is this really the risk that I wanna take now? Or perhaps not, if these are the consequences, perhaps this is not the time for me to do it. And so on a related note, then, um, say that one of our friends or partners just doesn't take this risk of COVID-19 as seriously as, say, we do. Um, and how do we talk with that? And how do we have conversations with that? With difficulty? <laughs> I mean, frankly, I have, I, it's, I, I'm sure the other people in the call are, uh, have also experienced how difficult this is. And I, you guys don't know me, but I'm really up. I mean, I'm really straightforward uh, and I'm totally tongue tied. 
in many situations. And there's only so much smiling and trying to be nice. And there's like all the other layers of how you could be perceived. It's super complicated. So I don't know. I will just say be as human as you can. Just, you know, I, you might not remember that or have you thought about this or I'm really uncomfortable with this. Talk about yourself. Don't, don't assume that person it's not doing their part. Yeah, I, I, I would add just real quick to that. There's, there's a notion of social responsibility that we all carry at this point in time. And if you think of things like, you know, I, I, um, um, the stay at home orders and all those sorts of activities that we've been engaging in, wearing masks, social distancing, those are all measures to look out for one another. And reminding somebody, one of our friends that, look, we're all engaging in, in a community act that only works if everybody participates and we need you to kind of step up your game in this context. I think that's a, you know, putting it on the social responsibility shoulders is one that a lot of folks can empathize with. Yeah. And I want to add to that because that was something that we, it was, we were very um, conscious in the, while writing the covenant. We don't want exactly what Matt said to become a, a shaming. And I think Betsy alluded to that. It's easy to make mistakes, even if we are very much trying to take care of a community. We make mistakes. We, I mean, I have found myself inside my friend's house without even noticing. And I think about this all the time and I'm pretty old. So, and it's, of course I care about the community. So just playing that game where you're reminding everyone that they're part of the community and they need to step up their game. But when we make mistakes, it doesn't mean that we're a bad person. Um, otherwise, nobody's gonna admit that we have mistakes. I mean, it's a disaster if we forget that we're humans. And you get to say, I, I, you know, I respectfully decline. Um, you get, you could, could probably say it in a um, uh, better way than that. But you know, you get, to, you get to say, glad, I'm glad we had this conversation. Um, and uh, you know, we don't quite see eye to eye on this. And let's um, let's do something else instead, because I really like you, or I really care about you, but I don't want to. I, I would be uncomfortable taking that level of risk or I'd be uncomfortable. You, you get to say that, you get to say that. You, you, do, you did before COVID and you, and you still do. Um, and you still have your friends to practice how you're gonna say it mm -hmm. until you figure out that you are more or less comfortable. So don't forget that either. And of course, wash your hands, open the window, take a shower. I mean, still do all those other things. Um, do your homework, study for your exam. Be a good person, exercise kindness. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with those reminders, <laughs> we'll um, go into the questions that students have asked. And actually um, the first two are ones that both Hannah and I feel, feel qualified to ask. And the first one is um, a great question. How do I breach the topic with my roommate of needing to use our room or space for intimacy, whether that be masturbation or otherwise. Um, so I'm going to be a um, answering that question. I think uh, the biggest challenge is that nowadays are because of we're not really allowed to be in as many public spaces or we don't have in person classes. For the most part, um, we have to spend a lot more time in our room than than we otherwise might. And so um, I think also a lot of the concepts or the, that we've were mentioned for the other questions about how to talk to friends or partners about COVID are kind of the, the same basic principles apply. Um, even if the conversation about sex and intimacy can be uncomfortable, the same principles of good communication apply. Um, being open, being transparent. And I think also another important thing is having these conversations well enough in advance of when you wanna be using the room with your roommate. Um, so because you spend so much time there and to be courteous to your roommate and to their space and so not to tell them last minute and to kick them out of their room. I just wanted to bring up um, at some point, I don't know if it's gonna come up, but the, the impact of alcohol or other um, uh, uh, decision-making altering drugs. Um, I would 
it, it's right. We do different things. We don't, we don't make, we, our judgment is, is different um, when we're under the influence. And I, it was pre COVID and it is during COVID. Um, but that certainly increased uh, risk taking um, inadvertently. So all these conversations should happen before you start drinking. <laughs> That's a really good point. Or, or, and then maybe there should be a plan. It's like, you know, if we, if we start drinking, we're not going to do this yeah. <laughs> or, or somehow bring, if, if you and your partner or you and your roommate or whatever, you know, the people involved do drink, you should talk about your, your plan should involve talking about how you're going to use or not use alcohol or other drugs. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we also got two other questions that kind of morphed into one great mega question. Um, and that is, I have struggled to find pleasure in sexual activity, either with a partner or alone. Um, so how can I meaningfully incorporate pleasure into my life, especially considering the social effects of COVID-19? And um, so I'll actually take this question because I've done a not insignificant amount of research about it. Um, so first I wanna talk about how, well, the sexual experience um, and with it pleasure is a really complex interplay of four things. Um, and those are physical, visual, auditory, and psychological stimuli. Um, now notice that none of those things actually require the immediate presence of another person. Um, sure, maybe it's easier, maybe it's less awkward, maybe it's less taboo with another person there, um, but you don't actually need it. So that means that this alone time during a pandemic is a great time for you to explore new things. Um, it's also worth mentioning here that sudden changes like, I don't know, a pandemic or political turmoil, um, might influence your desire. So for example, depression can totally curb your sex drive. Um, and on the other hand, um, a high stress situation might generate a need for immediate pleasure. So maybe your sex drive is super high right now. Um, and both of those end members and anything in between is totally normal and totally okay. So um, take this opportunity to explore yourself and remember that there's no shame in any fantasy or turn on as long as you're not harming anyone. Um, and remember that also you'll have to be patient with yourself. Like you might try a million things that just don't work for you, um, but you'll get to know yourself along the way and hopefully find pleasure. Um, we'll also put a list of resources in the chat near to the end, um, but there are some great podcasts and other books that talk about pleasure and how to find pleasure and um you know one that comes to the top of my mind right now is a really inclusive and all spanning podcast called doing it with hannah witten um and so learning about other people's experiences and adventures can also be great Um, so now we are closing up. Um, I guess if anyone has any last questions to put it into the Q&A box. Um, but um, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to the panelists. Um, and I'm gonna paste the resources into the chat box really quickly for everyone to look at. And these are resources um, that are all like podcast recommendations, but also resources from the GSC, OHP, and SNPR. Yeah, so um, that's all that we have discussed today. You can also read so much more online, the New York Times um, and whatnot have great articles about how to have sex during COVID. Um, yeah, so that's all for now. And thank you so much for coming. And thank you to the panelists for attending. Thank you for organizing. I think this is a very valuable conversation to have. have so thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>